So three key elements we would like to look at this afternoon. Knowledge, belief, and immersion in water as being essential elements of baptism. Before we go on to that, I'd like you to meet this young lady, Emma Mercer. She's known to her friends as Em. She's actually turning 12 next month. Uh, she's a fairly pleasant uh, young lady. She enjoys spending time with her friends. Uh, she enjoys school. Um, but she started asking some questions. See, a little while ago, she, um, she was given a, a project at school to do, and it was to, it was looking at history, but it was also looking at current events. And as she began this uh, project, she, her questions were, were basically about, uh, centred around the idea, well, how come there's so much evil that's been going on um, time after time in the history of the world? She started talking with some of her friends at school about it, um, some sort of shrugged, but one in particular started talking to her about someone called God, someone called Jesus Christ, and how these two people were connected with, with goodness. So it just started her thinking. Something else I'd like you to know about M is that when she was a baby, she was baptised, she had some water poured on her head, she doesn't remember anything of the incident. She's just got this photo um, to remind her or to tell her about it. Since then, she hasn't really been to any religious service much. She's been to a couple of weddings, um, to a funeral, but really no connection with any sort of uh, religious uh, institution or any sort of church. Last year, some of her friends uh, went to a big camp down by the lake and when they came back, they were telling her how it was quite an exciting time. Uh, lots of sort of games and activities uh, to do. And if you had put your name down by a certain date prior to the camp, on the very last day of the camp, you all went down to the big lake, you stood around this big lake, and those who put their name down could be baptised. And she asked, what does that mean? She said, oh, well, we, we went down into the water, we said something to the man or to the woman who was, um, who was doing it, and we went under the water. So that got her thinking as well. But a month ago, um, the friend that she'd been talking to about current events, he invited her to another kind of baptism. Uh, this is down at the local beach. And he, he explained the background. This particular the person who was getting baptised had been learning about the word of God, um, had similar questions to what M had had. And this person had confessed that they believed in Jesus Christ. And this friend asked Em if she would like to come along and witness this, to, to have a look at. And so Em, she was quite curious, she went along and she saw this person going out into the waves and some people standing around and they put this person under the water just for a brief time and then they came back out again. And afterwards there was a, a, there was a bit of a talk about being buried and then being raised to life again. So this left Anne with some more questions to consider. And it links in with the character that we read this afternoon, the character Cornelius. So if you've got your uh, Bibles open at Acts chapter 10, Cornelius is told, and this is from the New King James Version, something, something that you must do in verse 6. And we've, we're told about the kind of character that Cornelius was in verse 2. We're told that he was a devout man. We're told that he was one who feared God, and not only just one that feared God, but one who feared God with all his house. So that tells us he had quite a positive influence, um, not only amongst his own family, but also the people who served him. We're also told that he gave much alms, or he gave uh, a lot of money uh, to the people. And this wasn't really typical of the Romans um, in the area at the time. If you were sent to to Judea, it was basically because it was the last place on earth that you wanted to be sent to. So a Roman to be giving money to the Jews was, was very unusual. The other thing that this Roman did, instead of praying to the thousands of gods that the Romans did, he prayed to God always. This is the kind of character that Cornelius was. But there was one thing lacking in verse 6, 
he was told by the angel, he shall tell thee what thou oughtest to do. And so the premise of our talk this afternoon, what we'd like to look at is that for baptism or the taking on the name of Jesus Christ, it involves hearing, it involves belief, and full submersion in water. And this particular quote is from Acts 18 and verse 8. So as we go through this afternoon, we shall see that those, those same fundamental um, um, concepts being practised um, over and over again. First of all, hearing. Now, we're going to spend most of our time in the book of Acts and also in a couple of chapters in Romans. But I'd like you to come across backwards to the Gospel account of Mark. Just a few pages back to Mark. And chapter 16. And we're given what is generally referred to as the Great Commission by none other than Jesus Christ himself. We're told in Mark chapter 16 and verse 15, Jesus said unto them, that's Jesus said unto his disciples, he says, Go ye into all the world and preach the gospel to every creature. Now those who were here at Annie Arnold's talk a few weeks ago, what is the gospel? What is the gospel? Good news of... Thank you. The kingdom and the name of whom? Name of Jesus Christ. So the gospel. He that believeth and is baptised shall be saved, but he that believeth not shall be damned. So straight away that concept of hearing the gospel because someone has, has preached it to them, then follows belief, then follows baptism for salvation to, to ta start taking place. The other thing I'd like to consider that when we hear the gospel is that it evokes some sort of a personal connection within us. Can you come across now to the book of Acts? Chapter 2. So if you've got your hand in Acts chapter 10, it's just a few pages back to Acts chapter 2. Now I said that hearing evokes some sort of a personal connection. So there's a responsibility upon those who do preach the gospel that they preach it in an effective manner. You might preach it to in a different way to different people at different times, depending on the context at the time. In this case, we're going to consider the Apostle Peter, who used scripture, and he referred to the Jewish national hero of David, because he's preaching to the Jews at this time. So Acts chapter uh, 2 and verse 37. Now when they heard this, and these were um, the Jews in Samaria, it says they were pricked in their heart. In other words, their conscience was pricked. And they said unto Peter and to the rest of the apostles, men and brethren, what shall we do? So gain that premise, what shall we do? We need to do something. And then Peter turns to them and says, repent, in verse 38, and be baptised every one of you in the name of Jesus Christ, so preaching the gospel, for the remission or for the, for the covering, for the washing away of sins, and you shall receive the gift of the Holy Spirit. And the point behind these couple of verses here is that change is possible. Whatever our circumstance, whatever our walk in life, all of us need this sin-covering name of Jesus Christ. And that, as I said, change is possible. And for these people, repentance, as, as is our case, so that we might have the remission of sins. Next we come to... Belief. Now we've discussed that the gospel is the things concerning the kingdom and the name of Jesus Christ. Essentially it's something that's eternal and it's also something that, that talks about our salvation. So it's essential, of course, that we actually believe in this gospel. Can you come across to Romans chapter 6? And on the way, if you've got a coloured pencil, you can grab a, a coloured pencil out 
as well. Romans chapter 6. Now, there are five key points about our belief that I'd like to cover here from Romans chapter 6 and a little bit into Romans chapter 7. And each of them starts off with this phrase. In verse 3, know ye not. So if you've got a coloured pencil, you might like to colour that in. In verse 3, know ye not. In verse 6, knowing this. Over in verse 9. Knowing that, in verse 16, know ye not, and in chapter 7, verse 1, know ye not. So five little things to know or to consider. Now each of these things to know is actually in a cause and effect situation. Now just very quickly, a cause and effect is that something happens and as a result of that, something else happens. So the first cause and effect in verse 3, Know ye not that so many of us as were baptised into Jesus Christ were baptised into his death. So for us, being baptised into Christ means being baptised into his death. What exactly does that mean? Well, it means we have some sort of an association with Christ prior to us thinking about baptism or prior to us hearing about the gospel. There was no association with Christ. There was no, there was no change um, from our old way of life. And I'll talk about that a little bit later. And so Paul starts off by talking about this association with Christ is linked to us being buried or going under the water just as Christ was buried and then coming back up out of the water just as Christ was raised to life again. Not to any old way of life, but a new way of living. The second cause of an effect is in verse 6. Our old man, or our old way of life, is crucified, is put to death, so that the body of sin might be destroyed. In Colossians chapter 2, verse 14, when Paul wrote to the Colossians, he said, it's actually been blotted out. Christ nailed it to the cross, that old way of living. Now, he was... T- um, in, for a lot of the time he was talking about the law of Moses. But for us here in 2016, that can be any fears that we might have because we have no idea of what's going on for the future, any doubts, any anxieties. And what we're being taught is that in Christ, all that can be done away with. Change is possible, but it's only through Jesus Christ, by the grace of God, if we're going to be talking about our eternal Salvation. In verse, in verse 9 of Romans chapter 6, the third cause and effect, Paul says that knowing that Christ being raised from the dead dieth no more. And the effect is that death hath no more dominion over him. In other words, there's no more rule over death. We know that we are dying creatures and left to our own devices, that's where we're going to end up just back in, the, back in the ground. However, in Christ, we have this glorious hope that we will have life eternal. In other words, we're, we are, he says in verse 11, we are actually alive unto God through Jesus Christ our Lord. And of course, that's quite exciting because God is, uh, is eternal and, and, and ex- of course, extremely glorious. So we have that kind of a living. Our fourth cause and effect is that in verse 16 know ye not that to whom ye yield yourselves servants to obey his servants ye are to whom ye obey and he says that that can either be sin unto death or of obedience unto righteousness Um, think of it I I guess uh, this way When, when you when you take on a master's name you actually be take on their identity they own you um, to, to use a colloquialism. Um, in today's society, if we work for a particular company, um, different to people who might work for themselves, but yet they're still representing uh, some sort of uh, a company, they are representatives 
of that company. They take on that particular name in how they conduct themselves with clients, how they conduct themselves um, in their business ventures. Paul says that we are actually servants of righteousness. And he emphasises that in Romans chapter 6 and verse um, 18. He says, you're actually being made free from sin. You became the servants of righteousness. And this is talking about people who have taken on the sin-covering name of Jesus Christ. And finally, our last cause and effect, just in case you missed it, he says that in, verse, in chapter 7 in verse 1, he says, Brethren, or I speak to them that know the law, so in other words, those who are, who are of a Jewish uh, background, how that the law, the, the law of Moses, has dominion over a man as long as he lives. And then he goes into the uh, talking about the, the, the marriage, the marriage vow. Down in verse 4, he says, you're actually become dead to the law by the body of Christ because you're actually married to another. Now, I said we're not going to do too much verse hopping, but can you please come across to 2 Corinthians chapter 5? Because Paul goes into this a little bit, um, a little bit better uh, or a little bit more detail. So 2 Corinthians chapter 5 and verse 14. Now, Paul's actually here writing to um, a group of people who um, were quite, quite immoral um, the lists of, of things we will, quite, um, we will no doubt shudder at. But these were people who had taken on the sin-covering name of Jesus Christ. They'd made a change in their lives. And Paul reminds them in 2 Corinthians chapter 5 and verse 14, he says, The love of Christ constraineth us, or the love of Christ compels us or urges us, because we thus judge that if one died for all, then we're all dead. And that he died for all, that they which live should not henceforth live unto themselves, but unto him which died for them and rose again. Wherefore, henceforth know we no man after the flesh, in other words, the old way of, of living, yea, though we have known Christ after the flesh, yet now henceforth know we him no more. So we no longer know Christ according to the flesh. We know him to the new life because he's a new creature in verse 17, therefore, if any man be in Christ, he is a new creature. Old things are passed away. Behold, all things are become new. And all things are of God, who hath reconciled us or brought us back to himself by Jesus Christ and hath given to us the ministry of reconciliation. In other words, then in verse 20, he says, now then... For those of us who are baptised, he says, Now then we are ambassadors for Christ, as though God did beseech you by us. We pray you in Christ's stead, be ye reconciled to God. So as we, go, uh, as we continue further in our investigation there's some fundamental things that we need to believe. We need to believe that Jesus Christ died, but that he also rose again because of the power of God. And we need to believe that he lives forever and that through him we have covering of our sins. It's, it's like that where our sins have been washed away when we go down into the waters of baptism, uh, they've been blotted out, and that we are then reborn uh, when we come back up out of the waters of, of baptism. That's our first step in our faith, um, in, the, uh, in the manifestation of our belief. And we'll look at some more examples a little bit later. The third point is, and were baptised. What does that actually mean? If we remember that M, when she was very, very young, she had water poured over her head. That's actually sprinkling. And the Greek word for that is, is ren, rentizo, pardon my Greek if I've pronounced that wrong, but that's not actually mentioned as far as remission of sins through Christ Jesus. The word that we're looking at is the Greek word baptizo, from which we get the English baptize and baptism. And what does that mean? Abbott Smith says that it means to dip, immerse or sink. Sink. 
Liddell and Scott say that it's to dip repeatedly, to dip under. And Grim Thayer say to dip repeatedly, to immerse, to submerge, to cleanse by dipping or submerging, to wash, to make clean by water. And here's an example of someone that you will know from your Bible stories. Does anybody want to make a guess as to who that character might be? Um, sorry, it's a bit bad lighting, but I'll give you a clue. It's very muddy water. Who had an issue with muddy water? Naaman, exactly right. Naaman, and from 2 Kings chapter 5, verse 14. When um, in, the, in the Septuagint, which is the Greek um, translation of the Old Testament, that same word baptizo is used in that very same verse, 2 Kings chapter 5 and verse 14. When Naaman dipped himself, it's bat, um, baptizo. Okay, let's have a look at some examples now of some people who showed hearing belief and were baptised. Where's the proof that we need that we need this? Where's the proof that we actually uh, we need these things to happen? Well, if you've still got a hand in, in Acts, back to chapter 8. In Acts chapter 8 and in verse 12, the believers in Samaria says, when they believed Philip, preaching the things concerning the kingdom of God in the name of Jesus Christ, so there's the idea of the gospel again, they were baptised, both men and women. So they'd heard, they'd heard the gospel, they believed, and that's brought out in verse 13, Simon himself also believed, Simon who was a, who was a sorcerer, and then he was also baptised. This, uh, anybody recognise this picture? Sorry, it's a bit small. Two men in a chariot. Ethiopian. The Ethiopian eunuch. So uh, Philip, um, who met this uh, Ethiopian eunuch. Now, the interesting thing was that uh, because he was, a, he was a eunuch, he was not actually allowed to enter um, into, the, into the temple. It says he was coming back from the temple. But being a eunuch, he would not have been allowed to enter the temple. He was now about to be invited into something even more marvellous. So Acts chapter 8, so the same chapter, this time over in verse 36. Philip's up there in the chariot and they're discussing scripture uh, with each other. And it says in verse 36, As they went on their way, they came unto a certain water. And the eunuch said, See, here is water. What doth hinder me to be baptised? And here's the premise in verse 37. Philip says, If you believe with all your heart, you may. And then the eunuch gives a confession of his faith. He answered and said, I believe that Jesus Christ is the Son of God. So again, the eunuch had heard, he believed, and he was baptised. Now if we keep reading, what sort of, baptize, what sort of a baptism is this? It says, verse 38, he commanded the chariot to stand still and they went down both into the water. So that implies that there was enough water to cover them both. They, it, was, it was big enough to actually cover them, uh, both Philip and the eunuch, and he baptised him. And then in verse 39, when they were come up out of the water, and then um, the spirit ca um, catches away uh, Philip. So that implies that there was enough water for them to be covered. It wasn't just a, wasn't just a, a, a sprinkling. Um, third example here is uh, the one which we had as our focus reading just before, over in Acts chapter 10, which is talking about Peter and Cornelius. Same premise, over in verse 35 of Acts chapter 10. This is quite remarkable, um, this particular uh, story, which is why I'm going back to it um, again. In verse 44, for context, it says that while Peter yet spoke these words, the Holy Spirit fell on all them which heard the word. Now that's including the Gentiles, or the Romans, who were there at the same time. And then in verse 45, they of the circumcision, or that, those who were Jews, which believed were astonished, as many as came with Peter, because that on the Gentiles also was poured out the gift of the Holy Spirit. So this is now quite a radical concept. Here was the opportunity for salvation to come en masse uh, to the, the Gentiles. 
the Gentiles now had the opportunity to be baptised into the sin-covering name of Jesus Christ. And Paul picks up this premise over when he wrote to the Galatians. He says, it's essentially it's open to all who believe, whether you're a Jew, a Gentile, whether you're bond or free, whether you're male or, free or female, ye are all one in Christ Jesus. Our fourth example over in Acts chapter 18. This one's quite significant uh, in, in verse, verse 8, which just really uh, re-emphasising uh, the, the contention before. Crispus, the chief ruler of the synagogue, he believed on the Lord with all his house, and many of the Corinthians, hearing, believed, and were baptised. Now, I said before that the Corinthians were quite an, an immoral society. However, there was nothing stopping them from also hearing the word of God from believing and being become baptised. So that's, um, there's always that opportunity to, to change our immoral behaviour. And then finally, over in Acts chapter 19, um, Paul is speaking with some, with some disciples. Um, he says, in, it's, it's, it's recorded in verse 1 of chapter 19, Paul finds certain disciples... And he asks them in verse 2, have you received the Holy Spirit since you believed? So to become a disciple, you had, you had to have had baptised. And they said unto him, well, we have not so much as heard whether there be any Holy Spirit. See, back in those days, um, a lot of people who were baptised received the gift of the Holy Spirit so that they could, um, they could speak in different languages um, and they could prophesy to, to help the, um, the gospel be spread further and further. And so Paul says in verse 3, he says, Well, unto then what were you baptised? And they said, under John's baptism. Now, John, there was nothing wrong with John's baptism. John's baptism was that of repentance. Okay? And that's what Paul says in verse 4. But he says, Saying unto the people that they should believe on him which should come after him, that is, on Christ Jesus. And so these group of people, even though they had been baptised prior... They were then rebaptized, but this time in the name of the Lord Jesus. And there are several cases of people who might have been baptized as M was when she was a young girl. Does she need to be baptized again? If she wants to take on the sin covering name of Jesus Christ, she does need to be she does need to go through that, that process of baptism. Talking of M, what actually happened to her? Well, as I said, she'd been talking with her friend and she was interested. She was interested in to know more about, about God, about Jesus Christ and why these people were happy to go down to a freezing beach and be dipped underwater. Based upon her own observations of the world around her and thinking about some of the things that her friend has been talking to her about, She's starting to believe that there is something to this idea of Jesus Christ. However, she still has some questions to explore further. She's heard, she started to hear the gospel, but she's now cultivating her belief. In the meantime, her friend has invited her along to some social events. And in a couple of weeks' time, she's happy to come along to a Sunday school uh, session. What about those who have been baptised? Does it end there? Paul wrote this to Titus. In Titus chapter 3 and verses 3 to 8. He says that we ourselves were also once foolish. We were once disobedient. We were, we were deceived. We were serving various lusts and pleasures. We were living in malice and envy, hateful and hating one another. But when the kindness and the love of God our Saviour toward men appeared, not by works of righteousness which we have done, in other words, it's nothing to do of, of we ourselves, but according to his mercy, he saved us through the washing of regeneration and renewing of the Holy Spirit. Some of us have been baptised for, for quite a number of years. 
some of us more recently. But all of us have had those sins, those prior sins, washed away. In verse 6, whom he poured out on us abundantly through Jesus Christ our Saviour, that having been justified by his grace, we should become heirs according to the hope of eternal life. But it doesn't just end there. We have this wonderful blessing. We have taken that first step um, in our faith. And for those who might be considering baptism, or for those who like to explore it, whoa, sorry Ben, those who like to explore it further, that is what um, that is what we go through, or what we will be um, going through. However, beyond baptism, we have in verse eight this responsibility to continue developing our faith, to continue developing the fruits of the spirit, to to share the gospel with others. And that's what he means by saying in verse 8, this is a faithful saying. And these things I want you to affirm constantly that those who have believed in God should be careful to maintain good works. These things are good and profitable to men. So these things are beneficial to others as well as ourselves so that as many people as possible might receive the only crown of life.